So now we have justification by works. A third objection on the James chapter 2 point of view from others centers on the concept of justification by works in James chapter 2. The question is often asked, is not James implying that if someone is truly justified by faith, he will do good works? Appeal may be made to verse 24 for support, which quotes, I quote, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Alone is an adverb, keep that in mind. It modifies justified. In answer to this objection, it may be helpful to discover that in Scripture, justification means to be declared righteous, as righteous as God is by God. But there are three kinds of justification in the Bible. First, there is a justification by faith alone, which is a justification before God. Abraham, Genesis 15. Paul is clear in teaching that justification by faith is in the sight of God, Romans 3.24-2, Galatians 3.11. The good news of the gospel is that at the first moment of faith, the new believer is forensically declared to be just as righteous as Christ is righteous. That's what the word declared means. You have a position as far as God is concerned, a standing, that you are as righteous as he is, as his son. The second kind of justification is the justification by works or faith by works before God. That kind of justification is always presented in Scripture as, underline it, italicize it, emphasize it, heresy, as is evident by Paul's discussions in Romans and Galatians, many places here. But a third kind of justification in the Scriptures is a justification by works, as before men. Let's see. James specifically mentions the phrase justification by works three times. 221, 25, 26. Justification by works is in the sight of people, not God. Didn't I tell you that? This is the logical conclusion given the fact that James is responding to an objector who holds that faith cannot be seen. So how do you know if a guy's a Christian or not? By what he does. Thinks, says, and does. James calls on him to see Blepo, the word blepo, horeo, how Abraham's works justified him. Paul, in harmony with James, considered the possibility of Abraham being justified by works, but he qualifies it, but not before God. Who else? Mankind. So your faith before God gets you justified unto righteousness, unto eternal life. Now your faith, thereafter, your works thereafter, gets you justified by works. God already knows you're justified. He did it. And recognized in his omniscience your faith, moment of faith. But now who sees the works? Only man. Uh, in order to justify you before uh, man, can, you be, can your works be seen by man? Man doesn't know you're a Christian until you do something or say something. And that has to be tested as well. So with this in mind, one can be better approach the meaning of James 2.24. Their traditional understanding labors, and successfully in my opinion, to harmonize the verse with Paul by insisting that saving faith will inevitably produce good works. Far too much must be read into the verse to satisfy objectivity. A great harmony with Paul is achieved by understanding this, the verse is delineating two kinds of justification. I don't need to harmonize it. I just need to read it. It's an adverb. Several translations of verse 24 utilize the word only rather than alone. It's an adverb. You justified only. You can't say alone. So you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And that's what it is. It's an adverb. It's justified only. It's not justified only by faith, but in another way by works. In another way is kind of uh, qualifying. It's a, 
indicating the context. This translation opens the door to the alternative that James is referring to two different kinds of justification. You need to do that too there. Unline. Italicize. Emphasize. His readers need to comprehend that justification by faith is not the only way a person is declared righteous. Men declare this man, he's a, he's a good Christian. How? Because he talks and walks the way. If he doesn't talk and walk, he wouldn't know. The word is watching, and it is good works that justifies in the eyes of others. The world is watching, and it is good men, mankind. The world of mankind is watching, and it is good works that justifies good works that justify in the eyes of others. Now we have a dead faith. Again, it's simple definition here. Don't have to make it complicated. Dead means inactive. Right? What then does James mean by dead faith? The only definition James offers is that dead faith is a faith that does not have works and is by itself. For Paul, that is the very faith that brings justification before God. Evangelicals have been content to interpret dead faith as a false faith. But even in common everyday English on anything, there's no such thing as a false faith. There's such a thing as you faked believing, but you didn't believe. The closest, or we lied about it, the closest syntactical parallel to James 2.17 is found in Romans 7.8b. For apart from the law, sin is dead. No one would suppose that Paul intended to say that apart from the law, sin was a was false sin or an unreal sinfulness. Sin is still real and true sin, even apart from the law. The thought is that sin lies dormant and unrecognized until the law arouses it, arouses it to action. In the same way, faith apart from works is true and real faith. I hate to say true or real faith. Faith is faith. But works have a way of enlivening faith and arousing it to obeyance. Well, you know that a Christian, a person is a Christian, and is active as a Christian by looking at his works. So his faith is active. And when he's not doing any works, his faith is dead or inactive. You know, sometimes you can sleep and not, you know, somebody watching you sleep, he's, well, he's not a Christian, he's not doing it. He's sleeping! Give him a break! Nonsensical semantics. If the critical text of 2.20 is accepted, faith without works is considered useless. But regardless of the reading in verse 20, James has implied this uselessness of faith without works by calling into question its benefit. James, however, does not insinuate that faith without works cannot give eternal life. First of all, chapter 1, he did say it would. Faith alone, and you have eternal life. His interests resides in pragmatic matters. He has prepared for the thought of a useless dead faith in 126-27. In those verses, he faulted a devotion to the Lord that did not control the tongue or care for the needy. He concludes that this one's religion is useless. To what end, though? He got it by, by uh, faith alone in James chapter 1. Let's take a look at that. Every good thing given, 17, and every perfect gift, salvation, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, God's will, he brought us forth, born, born us forth, birthed us by the word of truth, not by anything he did, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. He brought us forth by the word of truth. We didn't do anything. Now that you're saved, it goes on about how to behave. That's where we are in James chapter 2. So James has implied this uselessness of faith without works. And it is useless relative to producing the value of your Christian life and testifying to others 
by your deeds and words. So, useless is the faith without works by calling into question its benefit to others. James, however, does not insinuate that faith without works cannot give eternal life. His interest resides in pragmatic matters. He has prepared for the thoughts of a useless dead faith in 126 to 27. In those verses, he faulted a devotion to the Lord that did not control the tongue or care for the needy. He concludes that this one's religion is useless. If a Christian does not bridle his tongue, is that reason to question his conversion? Said politely, such an interpretation misses the point. Are you examining somebody else based on their works, whether they're a believer or not? The only thing I would examine in another is whether or not they fed back to me what they think it needs to be saved. If they don't say faith alone and Christ alone, I might question that. But I'm still not perfect because I'm not omniscient. James is declaring that righteous religious devotion that does not act mercifully to the needy or does not speak mercifully to others is, the, is devotion that is impractical. It is valuable to return to the themes of the epistle introduced in the re opening remarks of the book. After James reaffirms that endurance can mature our faith, he admonishes us to ask God for the wisdom we lack. Well, we must ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Does that mean you don't have salvation? No. In this context, there is no impression that those who lack faith in prayer are false Christians. Or maybe just say not. I wish you would say not Christians. <clears throat> you can't be a false Christian. You're either not or you are. <coughs> to the contrary, the terminology identifies an immature believer. While the readers trusted God for their eternal life, they doubted he would give them wisdom. The rest of this lack of faith is that the believer's life becomes unstable and immature. This theme of immaturity is carried further in 2.5, where James affirms that the economically poor believers are rich in faith. The tacit contrast is between a poor or weak faith and a rich, mature faith, not a true faith and a false faith. Finally, or not a, a true, uh, not a faith, or no faith. Finally, the elder, as a righteous man, can offer a prayer in faith for the sick. To do so is to offer a prayer that works. Once again, it is ludicrous to suppose that James contrasted a prayer offered in true faith with some sort of prayer offered with false faith. Again, there's no such thing as true or false faith. It's what you believe. And what you believe may be true, and what you believe may be false. But nevertheless, what you believe is, a, is I hate to say it, a true faith. See, I don't believe that the earth is flat. I don't believe, I, I truthfully believe that the earth is flat. But the earth isn't flat. So what is, the content of your belief may be true or false. But the belief itself can't be true or false. Belief is that you believe it. Well, you don't. You can't say, I falsely believe something. If you said that in a conversation, people will look at you like, he's got a screw loose. I falsely believe. What does that mean? So, once again, it is ludicrous to suppose that James contrasted a prayer offered in true faith with some sort of prayer offered with false faith. But he does, that he does imply that not all Christians are able to offer such mature, powerful prayer. All of these factors lead to a single conclusion. Dead faith, for James, is a real faith, inactive. You know, for James, is an immature, weak faith, and not a false faith, as so many have supposed. Why does he just say the word inactive? You have a dead battery. It's inactive. It's still under the hood. Change it out for an active battery, a live battery. Conclusion. 